Uh, thank you so much, Sunshine, and it's really a pleasure to be here today uh, here at Navy Pier at WBEZ, and uh, thanks so much for all of you for attending and for the Metcalf Institute for organizing this. Uh, I'll be talking today about climate impacts on human health and air quality. Air quality is really the bread and butter of my research, but of course, day-to-day -day air quality is affected by day-to-day -day weather, energy use, uh, transportation systems, land cover. So air quality connects with a wide range of issues. And at the Nelson Institute for Environmental Studies, I often find myself working across disciplines and different questions. Um, the, uh, before I move on, though, I'll just note, since Sunshine mentioned the Earth Science Women's Network, uh, this really is a great uh, source for connecting with uh, leading women, especially early career in the geosciences. And in fact, one of our members just won the MacArthur Award, uh, Tammy Bond. And, um, and many of them are on Twitter. So um, anyway, just feel free to be in touch with me. Our, our website is eswnonline.org. So today I'm going to be starting big and then working uh, toward air quality as a specific topic. But when we think about climate impacts on human health, it's really uh, hard to think about an aspect of health and well-being that isn't connected to climate or weather. Uh, if you think about uh, susceptibility to disease, slipping and falling on icy pavement, uh, heat stress, cardiac arrest, access to nutrition and food, water quality, all of these are health impacts that are directly related back to uh, weather and climate, whether locally or in terms of uh, global scale systems. Uh, yesterday when I spoke at a related Metcalf uh, event, I presented the top pie chart here from a 2013 report from the Centers of Disease Control outlining where, where deaths in the United States could be attributed to between 2000 and 2009. This was from a 2013 report and it found that the leading weather related cause of death was heat. Well in the audience I had some very well read folks including Bill Sternberg from USA and News Report who pointed out that in 2014 there was a Center for Disease Control uh, study that came out with exactly the opposite um, uh, uh, result and um, that actually is shown here at the bottom um, that showing that cold is the number one uh, cause and the truth is these two charts while seemingly totally contradictory with each other I think highlight the difficulty of pointing the finger at any one death on whether it's heat or cold because if somebody dies from a heart attack on a hot day, did they die because it was hot or would they have died already? And if somebody contracts pneumonia, did, would they have contracted it already or would, did they contract it because of the cold? And all of these studies clarify that challenge. And my goal here in showing these is not to um, parse the details, but to make the point that there are many, many connections between weather and health. And um, it starts to get a little easier to connect the dots when we don't talk about heat or cold, but actually talk about specific causal factors. Um, even though it's hard to say uh, whether a particular death is due to heat, um, there's been some striking um, situations where there's been unusual heat waves, especially hitting places like Chicago and Europe that don't have the standard infrastructure to cope with extreme heat. And um, these are associated with very clear changes in the number of uh, adverse health outcomes, including death. And what you're seeing here, this is a uh, chart taken from the Center for Disease Control. And what you see in the, um, this covers July of 1995, with the red line being the number of deaths throughout the month, the black line being the temperature through in 1995, and then the uh, yellow line being the average number of deaths per day in a Chicago July, and the blue line being the average temperature in a Chicago July. And so what it's showing is that early in July of 1995, the number of deaths was about the same as you would expect from any other year. Um, and the temperatures were in the ballpark of what you would expect from any other year as well. But then toward the middle of the month, there's this drastic rise in temperatures getting up above 100 degrees Fahrenheit and a few days later we see a similar peak in the number of uh, deaths. This same type of data are available 
for a few other isolated cases where it was really a drastic extended heat wave, like in Europe in 2003. But, but a similar idea is what epidemiologists parse out of hospital data and mortality data all the time to try to find links between specific um, exposures or, um, or climate parameters and, um, and health outcomes. Given the changes in climate that have been talked about throughout the day, um, many of the risk factors that, are, uh, uh, that epidemiologists attribute to uh, mortality uh, are projected to change. And of course, there's sort of a worst case scenario and a better case scenario. And that has to do with what projected global emissions do over the next 100 years. But um, this is just to sort of to take the Chicago health story a little bit further is that when we think about um, moving into the future that there's typically about uh, 150 heat related deaths per year in Chicago. Again, recognizing it's hard to point the finger at which specific deaths uh, are due to heat. But if we uh, uh, extend this sort of uh, lower case assumption of heat uh, related mortality future to the future, it's somewhere projected to you know double to triple to even going up a factor of six or seven. One challenge when talking about climate impacts on health, especially when we're talking about severe weather or air quality or other you know, uh, immediate issues, is saying, is this particular event due to climate change or not? And really the here, issue here is that we have a distribution of uh, weather characteristics. When we talk about what is climate, it's just the long-term average of the weather. So when you have the long-term average changing, then something that maybe used to be an unusually high event is now going to become much more standard. And we're going to see uh, outcomes that we never saw before. And one uh, metaphor that I like to uh, use to describe this is very much like uh, the Dow Jones index. It goes up and down on a day-to-day -day basis. But as the economy is recovering, we expect to see it going up and up more days and down <coughs> fewer days. And so it's not like you can take the Dow on any one day and say that this is indicative of a long-term rise or fall in the economy. But if the Dow is showing a rise and another rise and another rise, this is completely in line with what we would expect from an economic recovery. <clears throat> Besides heat, there's a number of different weather-related uh, changes that we expect from climate change that we're already seeing and that have health outcomes. And what I'm showing here is a map from the Natural Resources Defense Council uh, just for 2011, but showing the number of events of record rainfall in light blue, record snowfall in medium blue, and record temperature in red, along with wildfire, droughts, and floods. And again, it's not saying that any one of these record-breaking events wouldn't have happened without climate change. Some records are going to be broken even when we have a steady state situation. But that this continual breaking of records is exactly what one would expect from uh, the scientific projections of climate change, especially the worsening of extreme precipitation and the more frequent um, heat events that uh, Don Wobbles and others talked about earlier today. So uh, one particular health uh, outcome of climate change that is the focus of my own work is the impact of climate on air quality. And there's, when we think about air pollution, there's hundreds of different chemicals that we might spring to mind. But of these hundreds of chemicals, there's really six that are regulated by the EPA as having a, a threshold below which exposure is considered safe and above which it's considered problematic. And these are called criteria pollutants by the EPA. And of these criteria pollutants, there's really two that are persistently above the health-based threshold across much of the US. And when I say much of the US, it's not geographically a wide area, but it's very much the places that people live. And in fact, nearly half of the US population lives in areas that are above the health-based threshold for ozone and particulate matter, these two uh, pollutants. In fact, when we even think about what a very hot day looks like, what we think about is this hot, smoggy day. And this uh, picture from the cover of Nature was taken from um, 
This was a story that I contributed to with co-authors a number of years ago, but we wanted to have a photo that we could give to nature that looked like a super hot day. And we can't see heat, but what we see here is smog, and this is in fact um, uh, Chicago in 1995. So when we think about um, uh, weather impacts on ozone and particulate matter, these two main um, widespread pollutants of concern, there's a number of different ways that weather affects uh, the pollutants. And they operate in some different ways. Ozone is the most sensitive to temperature, with hotter days leading to higher ozone due to changes in chemical reactions, uh, changes in the uh, humidity, and changes in the amount of natural um, hydrocarbons that are released from trees and plants. Um, both ozone and particulate matter respond to stagnation, meaning when there's not very much wind, that there's a buildup of these uh, pollutants. Uh, the opposite to that is sometimes said the solution to pollution is dilution. So when there's not much solution, dilution, you get quite a lot of uh, buildup there. Uh, this particular chart was from a 2009 uh, paper in the journal Atmospheric Environment. But even though it, it came out a couple years ago, it was actually the basis for an article just last month in the New York Times entitled, uh, Cities Air Problems Only Get Worse with Climate Change. And just to illustrate this point a little bit further, uh, I'm showing some uh, data from Chicago from a paper that I wrote with a team, including Don Wubbles, uh, in 2008. And we looked at uh, ozone in, here in Chicago and compared it with weather conditions, and in the top uh, left corner, you see that on hotter and hotter days, we get higher and higher ozone. And in the lower right panel, we see that on sunnier days, we get higher ozone. And in the two uh, middle panels, those are just, um, or the crossways panels, those are uh, winds in different directions. And in both cases, when we have winds close to zero, those are also the days that have the highest uh, ozone. So this, these relationships really are borne out uh, and when we look at the data pretty clearly. Another way to look at this relationship between temperature and ozone is to count up the number of days each year that has really high temperatures and compare it with how many bad ozone events occurred that same year. And here's data for Chicago going back to 1980. And we see that the years that have the most days above 90 degrees Fahrenheit are also the years that have the most number of days above 75 parts per billion. And I'll pause here to, to mention why 75 parts per billion is the number that we're using. And that's because that's the limit set by the EPA on what counts as a um, unhealthy ozone day. Now, of course, this limit is somewhat uh, up for discussion because there's not one limit where our lungs have a little switch and uh, turn on and off about our response. And in fact, the Clean Air Science Advisory Council that advises the EPA on the appropriate level to make this threshold has for a number of years recommended a range between 60 and 70. And ever since, uh, I believe 2006, I'm not sure exactly what year this started, but the, um, the review of the EPA ozone standard was set under the Bush administration at 75 parts per billion, which is above that zone recommended by the Science Advisory Council. And it was maintained at 75 by the Obama administration. And it's, the revision to this standard is, was due out in 2013. It has not yet been released. So it may be coming out any time. And it's certainly a major um, impact on some of the economic activities uh, around in every county across the United States. In fact, here in Chicago, for many years, we've had to take our cars to be emissions tested, and that was because we were in violation of this ozone standard. The way the ozone standard works is it's four strikes and you're out. So it's OK to have a few hot days each summer and a few days above the threshold each summer. You just don't want to have four or more. So you can see in some of these years, like 1988, here in Chicago, there were nearly, there were over 50 days that were above this threshold. Back in 1988, it was a somewhat different standard, but this is comparing it to today's standard. The good news is when, thank you. 
Good news is when it comes to air quality and ozone that the United States has been making, ever since 1970, major investments to have less emitting cars, less emitting power plants, less emitting industry. And in fact, we spend about $50 billion a year to keep our air clean. And that's why we have major industrial centers, but we are not having air quality problems the way that you hear about on the news in China and India. In fact, even though this process started back in 1970 with emission reductions, it continues to go on uh, with the air getting cleaner and cleaner each year. And what I'm showing here are satellite uh, images uh, taken by a satellite that passes over the whole Earth about 1.30 in the afternoon each day. And this was the average for 2005 in the upper panel and the average for 2010 in the lower panel. And you can see that just between 2005 and 2010, uh, this key ingredient to ozone called NO2 has gone down significantly and that's mostly due to fuel standards and uh, uh, technologies for electricity production and fuel switching away from coal. So what I'm showing here comes back to this issue of who's passing and who's failing uh, the ozone standard on the top and the particulate matter standard on the bottom. Apologies that the, that the lines are coming in a little bit thin here. But what we see is that while most of the country is passing both of these standards, many of the most populated areas in the country are failing. Uh, and for example, when it comes to the ozone standard, uh, historically most of the counties around the lakes have either been failing or near failing the ozone standard. But that same uh, atmospheric chemistry isn't uh, in place. It's a different set of processes for PM 2.5, so we don't see the lake effect so much. But we see that both ozone and uh, particulate matter are decreasing. Uh, and so when, with all these investments and all these improvements that we've been making, this question about how climate change and more hot weather could set us back is really an important issue, both for public health and for um, the cost of energy and emission controls. I'm going to end here with uh, a particular set of uh, a map for the state of Wisconsin. I was trying to find a, one for the whole Midwest and I'm, I apologize that I couldn't find an up-to-date one in a timely manner. Uh, but what you see here is what's called the design value. And the design value is um, the metric that's used to compare with that 75 parts per billion to say are we passing or are we failing. You could sort of compare it as like the equivalent of a GPA or something like that. This is the three-year average of the fourth highest ozone value. So this is really what determines which side of the line you're on. And here in Wisconsin, what you're seeing in red are the um, sites that have a design value above 75. And so these are, this is the county, this is Sheboygan, which is the only county right now in Wisconsin which is failing the ozone standard. But as we wait to see where the EPA will place that threshold, the question really comes out what, which other counties are going to go back into non-attainment despite the extensive and costly emission reductions that have already been put into place. And so if the standard were set between 70, uh, at 70, then all of the orange sites and counties would be out of attainment. If it were site set at 65, then the yellow sites would be out of attainment. And if it were set at 60, which is the lower bound of that zone recommended by the Advisory Council, then actually every s monitor in the state of Wisconsin would be out of attainment. So this is really... Uh, as we wait for the news of what this new standard is, it really uh, plays out as an important issue real across the whole U.S., including the Midwest. So I'll end there and look forward to questions during the panel period. Thank you.